my name is Chris McCree. I uh, work in London and I have a very unusual role because I work between adult mental health um, and our child protection services. Um, although in England our child protection services also include children with needs, so it kind of probably might be slightly different to what you're uh, used to. Um, I've been doing this role and trying to implement a think family strategy for about 10 years. So I'm very passionate about it. And now we've got 20 minutes. I've always got more slides than I can ever talk to. So if the slides are in the syllabus, so some of the detail if you want to go back to, then you know it's there for your information. Um, and I will try and um, get the kind of the key elements over in, my, in the 20 minutes I've got. Do all time keeping you. So I'm going to talk to you today about the parental mental health team, but I want to try and give you some of the history about why it started and um, what some of the challenges that we face and continue to face um, running the service. Um, I've got a strict script, but I'm going to try and sort of talk freely as well because uh, otherwise it'll be very boring with this in 20 minutes. Um, interesting enough, uh, my uh, friend actually um, lent me the artwork to do this and it really kind of brought to me some of the kind of when the sort of issue of challenges in the title it really made me think how creatively we've had to work over the last 10 years because none of this is kind of a given none of it is kind of oh yes here's the money or oh, here's you know some practitioners we've had to be incredibly creative about how we do this so i am going to talk to you about the front and mental health team but as i say i want to try and give you some kind of history to you know how that came about because it didn't just drop out of nowhere it wasn't just a few of us thought oh wow that would be a really nice idea um, I was asked to give some objectives and so kind of there are your kind of objectives what I hope is that you go away with a sense of or reinforcement because I think it has been talked about over the last two days about how early intervention is really really important and even if we can't evidence it and even if we can't prove it Passionately, I believe that it's absolutely the way forward in order to help parents with any degree of problem, whether it be substance misuse, mental health, or domestic violence. Um, so, creative approaches to challenge. Um, it's hard for staff in adult mental health services to see clients as parents. Increasingly, they do recognise the child protection concerns, but often they don't see what part they can play. Um, apart from referring on to another person, what's happening in the UK a lot is there's always another specialist. So, you know, oh, you know, I can't do this, somebody else will kind of do it. So some of us, um, as I say, as part of our kind of developing family strategy, have tried to be a bit more creative. What are some of the challenges we've been facing? Well, trying to move away people from the individual focused work, information sharing, which has been talked about before, Boundaries and what this means, we do a lot of work in the team with community organisations, so the South London Gallery, the Unicorn Theatre, which is a children's theatre, they're all local facilities um, providing either art, theatre, play, whatever they're doing, and so it's a very different culture to working with a health project or a social care project. Culture both also in terms of our families and what their experience of family is. We have a lot of um, families who have no recourse to public funds. So they're not from the UK, they've come over from by the traffic, or they've, they've sought uh, asylum but haven't been organised enough to get their papers, and so they are very vulnerable because they have no access to any public, what we would call public funds. Our roles and responsibilities, what have we got, what do we need to do, where does our kind of responsibility stop and start? Conflicting demands, um, Another key issue is being paid to support. Um, I'm a parent, I've got two t teenage children who are very jealous. <laughs> I'm here on my own, <laughs> and they're not with me. Um, but they've had, they've had to cope with my stress while I got ready for this um, presentation. Um, when I was a parent to, when they were young, I phoned my friends. So I used my mates who had older children going, is this normal? <laughs> is how I feel okay? Is the fact I want to weep for 24 hours? Is the fact that my child has cr cried for two hours? Is that okay? A lot of families we work with don't have those people to check out what's okay and what isn't. And I'm very passionate about the fact that we need to recognise we're paid to be with people. 
And one of the key things that the team tries to do is to enable people to feel confident to build relationships with people that don't, that aren't paid to be with them. So friendships, relationships outside within their own community, particularly those people who are vulnerable, who are scared of either being deported, scared about being talked about being a parent or being a vulnerable parent. In the UK at the moment, we've got a big debate about long-term versus short-term interventions. We've moved into a kind of dynamic, short-term, everything will be okay in eight weeks. As one parent said, <laughs> who said that I would be cured in eight weeks? Okay? Um, we do do short-term interventions because we see a lot of people, but we also recognise the importance of long-term relationships. Our funding for the team is year on year. We have to, or I have to, um, make sure that the team do what they do and I have to pay thanks to the team um, and all the supporters of the work over the last eight, 10 years. One for funding us and believing in us, uh, but also the team, if I ask them to, you know, tick data, collect data, they do it. Because they know that the team's survival depends on their commitment. The real great story about this is the seagull standing the other way. And that's what I think we try and do, is that we want to stand out and we want to be different um, in order to kind of really challenge um, our, our local systems. So why are under fives a vulnerable group? We've talked a lot over the last, um, feels like a long time, but two, one and a half days, um, about the vulnerability. And in, in, as Adrian has talked about, in the UK we do serious case reviews of child deaths, um, <clears throat> where services have been significantly involved, um, and the highest risk is, is, is death, particularly to one-year-olds. But we know, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence, that all the other developmental fe features of being an under five are, are key to how we are as an adult. So our emotional, our physical, our, all our development, you know, it is really key at that point about teaching and learning and relationships um, and trust is, is absolutely key before the age of five. Um, we have a family strategy which is what I'm responsible for implementing. <laughs> so we're on stage two. This is co-written with a parent um, and we've had active involvement from young carers, parents, um, children's services, um, child and adolescent services, adult mental health. So there's been a systematic sign up. Um, it does take a lot of work to keep it going. <laughs> it's, you have to keep nagging. I'm a nag. <laughs> my little, little name. Um, so, but the history behind this, why did it happen? In 2004, two children died, both killed by their mothers. One child was a five year old whose mother took her own life and that of his, her child. And the other was a baby less than three months old. And whilst his mother was experiencing a major relapse of her mental illness, inadvertently took the life of her child. The key issues with these families were the lack of professional understanding of the needs of the child, lack of any communication, and a lack of a thing family approach. It certainly wasn't the lack of service involvement. All of, both of these families had significant service involvement. They had adult mental health, they had children's services, in, in one case, because the five-year-old actually had his own disability. Um, so it wasn't for the lack of provision, interestingly enough. Um, the, the lady with, um, who took the life of her baby was very well known to our services so, and had a previous child. So actually, if the care coordinator, as we call them in the UK, had actually looked back at her first and sat with mum and said, what happened the first time you had a child? How did it go? Because actually she had a very long admission to her mother and baby, and actually the child was foster for a period of time. And then grandma came into the picture and helped, and grandma continued to look after her adult daughter and her first, and her first grandson. But we didn't look at any of that. So hence the development of family strategy which tries to align itself with government policy, although that's changeable, depending on who's in power at the time. Um, but it tries to highlight the philosophical need for a strategy 
So that we do have a lot of parents. It is important that we recognise what their needs are, but we also need to recognise the needs of children. So it's that, and we've had those difficult conversations with parents. We've talked about our roles and responsibilities, what we need to do and why we talk about risk, um, because we can't avoid those conversations. But as I think somebody said at some point, if you have those conversations at the beginning, at the point of assessment, as a natural part of your coming into the service, wherever it is, then actually when you're in a crisis on a Friday afternoon, me as a, as a nurse talking to you as a parent about why you might, we might need to involve child protection services is less of a shock. Because actually parents don't want to harm their children. Parents know they need help. And whatever services need to wrap around, it's much better if they know that that might happen as part of the assessment, as opposed to crisis, when it's all going pear-shaped, and it's usually on Friday at 5 o'clock. Yeah? So, that's what the family strategy, we've, we've developed training, we've developed training packages, um, and, as I say, we've also got a film about parents. So, okay, very quickly, solid data. I go a bit dyslexic with data. But, solid is young population, I think that can be the key thing is that the 42% of um, children living in single parent households. So the additional stress that, that brings both financially and emotionally. Um, parents always say to me, whenever you talk Chris, please make sure you give our messages. I can't give, um, oh what's the word, sort of the importance to it as much as I would want to, but the key thing they say is they want services that don't discriminate, that understand the needs and that are honest with them. Um, the team, the, the, in terms of the parental mental health team, it's a systemic, it's um, nurse-led, it's um, imaginative because it uses groups and home visiting and one-to-one uh, -one intervention. It has a very good understanding of attachment. That is key to understanding. It has very honest conversations with the parents when they come into the service. It understands the stigma and the difficulty parents have talking about their situation, but that is part of the inherent part of the assessment. It's really important that we have those conversations early on. And if parents struggle to engage, we go and take them. So if they want to join a group, and we know they're going to struggle because they've got a two-year-old and a one-year-old, and the bus system in London is relatively good, but it doesn't necessarily go the way you want it to do, uh, we'll go and pick them up. So we'll get them on the bus. Um, all the groups take place in our children's centres, which are uni what we call universal services. So the idea is that they then engage with universal services so that they're not dependent on us forever. Mm -hmm. They're actually empowered to kind of go, do you know what, this children's centre is quite nice. So we've had lots of new ones built. It's not too bad. And actually, that kind of parent support work is quite nice, really. And so the idea is that we help people move on. Um, the only eligibility criteria for this service is having a child under five and having a parent who has some degree of mental distress. We don't expect the practitioners to make that diagnosis. So it's health visitors, midwives. They can just have a woman who's going, I can't cope, and weepy. And, and they can make a referral. Okay? Um, it may well be that when the parent gets there, they go, well, we don't really know why they've been referred. We'll do some signposting. That's fine. But we will try and ensure that um, people get the right to the right place. Um, so boring. I've talked about the sort of services. Um, we are doing. I'm just going to run through these. We've do, we're doing one particular group that we're evaluating with our local art gallery, and so the art are doing their evaluation, and health are doing their evaluation, which is a very interesting dynamic, and it's a very different set of languages that as a non-artist scares me to death. <laughs> um, but we have seen, and, and we, we commonly see it, any, a decrease in sort of stress, a decrease in, in um, depression, and an increase in um, um, social kind of, or a decrease in social isolation. Um, in terms of commonalities between participants, um, parents talk to one another. All the groups we do have an opportunity for parent time, for maybe a couple of weeks, 
and then parent and kid time. Um, apart from one, which is the therapeutic toddler group, which is a long-term group based on an Anna Freud model. Some people might know that. Um, and that's for parents who are perhaps struggling more with parenting and there's an awful lot more kind of role modelling. So the whole group is with the child, uh, uh, the toddler and the parent. Um, it's about having fun. And what's really interesting is when a parent said to a worker, do you know what, I didn't know that you had to buy toys until the child was five. So we said, no, no, it's really good for kids to have toys, but we know you haven't got a lot of money. So anyway, she went and bought some toys, but she bought toys for a five-year-old. Yeah. So the next time the team went and said, look, shall we come with you? And we went with her and took the toys back and exchanged them for... So some of the stuff we do is really simple. It's not complicated. It's, it's pretty basic. I'm not going to give you Ian's story, which is a bit of a shame, but I've put... Um, Um, on the, your chairs, there is a just a short article about the team, which gives a, a parent story. I'm always very keen that people need to hear uh, parent stories, and I was going to tell one, but it didn't matter how many times I chimed to myself. <laughs> you know, you never had enough time. Our future aspirations, well, we want to obviously secure for funding for a longer period than a year, um, and we want to continue to seek additional funding for those creative projects, because the feedback we've had from parents the recent group we were doing in the theatre group, parents were saying, I have never been to the theatre. And they go and they have fun. They go with their kids and just have... And the theatre, it's a children's theatre in London, have been brilliant because they've just gone, wow. And so they've kind of, they've really worked with us and said, and, and they, they then gave um, about 40 free tickets. So it's also about <laughs> the added gain that you might get. And parents actually took their children and their other children and their families at the weekend to the theatre without any of us picking anybody up or doing anything more than just that facilitation. We are going to be taking part in a research study looking at the social and emotional needs of the under fours. It's a kind of screening and intervention tool. It's very early stages in research. And maybe, maybe I'll put in another abstract and come back to the next conference and talk a bit more about that. Maybe. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of future involvement in study regarding parents with diagnosis of personality disorder because there is a lot of difficulties, a lot of myths, a lot of kind of challenges and, and, and it's, I think it's important work right? because I think there's a lot of um, perceptions um, that don't get explored enough um, and we will continue to kind of work with um, our, the Centre for Parent and Child Support to develop our training package for adult mental health staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 We had CPS to support us parents through our hardships too, to continue being able to be there for our children and provide for them the way they deserve to be. I mean, what's interesting about the team, and very unusual in the UK, is funded by children's services. So it's an adult service um, funded by children's services. And I'm one day I'm waking, I'm going to sort of go, they, one day they're going to wake up, really. <laughs> um, but I think it is, I think uh, for us it was, um, I mean, very sadly. Um, and very passionately, um, I always keep the deaths of those two, two children very alive in my mind and the work that we do. Because that was the kind of start of it. I think for me, having the family strategy as a kind of overarching kind of um, document and getting people on board in order to support me, um, and, and there's been some fantastic people who've kind of supported me over the years. So we worked as a group because we didn't just kind of go, oh, we want a team. Mm -hmm. The family strategy came first, and then, right, what services, what, what's going to meet the needs of the parents that don't meet? A lot of the parents we see would not normally meet the threshold for adult mental health services. Some do, because we'll work across the board. So we'll work with child protection, and we'll work with um, adult mental health. But some of the parents actually would never meet the threshold. They would just rumble along until crisis hits, ambulance, hospital, mm -hmm. child in foster care. How do you know. 
Uh, if you email me, my email is there. I will send you one. Okay, and how much? Just email it. Awesome. <laughs> I'll email anybody. Hmm? Where's your email? It's just there. Yeah, yeah, it's sorry, it's it's online. Online. I gotta go take a picture yeah. of that. <laughs> Okay. Um, first, I just want to make a comment because you mentioned that a lot of your families are afraid of dealing with the child protection agencies. Um, one of the, um, something I just been to earlier in Australia, it's called the Department of Child Protection and Family Support. Yeah. And I know from personal experience, the first time I ever tried to call child protection for help, I was told we are child protection services, not child preventative services. So how do they, where you live, how do they assist families so that they're not getting into the system and the resources are provided prior to having these crises? I think, I mean, our services are, uh, are slightly different and they, they differ across sort of, mm -hmm. sort of borough to borough. But, you know, what I'm used to is, is children's services where child protection is an aspect of that. So um, in, we've just had recent government guidance um, review um, called Working Together, and it's very clear in that document that says early help is a prime responsibility of the local authority, and that each local authority has, has been charged, if you like, with providing early help services. Um, so children's services, where child protection sits, knows that they've got to kind of provide early help. And actually, in the UK, they don't want to bring, it's too costly, they don't want to bring people in. In fact, I said to somebody earlier, it's, it's quite hard for us to get children into child protection services that we think need to have that support, because mm -hmm. the threshold's actually really high. So um, I think it's, again, it's about the who's responsible for that early help kind of okay. offer, if you like. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's probably not answered your question. No, that's okay, but what would you suggest that we do where we live to try to, you know, make the, the experience less adversarial, shall we say? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think the one thing we did from the very beginning, I had a colleague, um, Paul Angeli, who was the, one of the senior managers in um, Children's Services, who was very engaged in this whole project. So I think it's sometimes down to finding individuals who you know think in a like-minded way and getting them around the table. Because if you get a like-minded individual, they will know somebody else. Yeah. Um, and they will then talk, have that conversation with that person who might be not quite so like-minded, mm -hmm. but they will ne take the next step, just say. But it, there is something about key stakeholders around the table. How did you get past the diagnosis of the parent, not needing a diagnosis of the parent? I think because we're funded through children's services and because we're early help, um, and because people don't quite know what to do with us. So adult mental health go, okay, you're bringing money into the trust, we're not going to worry too much. Yeah. Um, and we don't, and, and, and we don't have a psychiatrist in the team, but clearly where we are concerned about somebody's mental health, what the team are able to do is work really well with adult mental health. And we've done, a, I've done a lot of work, because of my role, I've done a lot of work with the adult mental health in order to help them understand the whole issue around Think Family. So, and they see the team as a real advantage because people who get referred, they no longer have to say, sorry, there's no service. They can go, yippee, you've got a child under five. You can uh -huh. go to this service. And so quid pro quo, if we need a psychiatry, we need a team approach because of the risk, we go, look, we'll continue to work with this family, but we need your extra help because actually we have got a mum or a dad talking about suicide and we can't manage all that. It's a very, very small team. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.